How many of you have heard the term a man after God's own heart, especially as ascribed to David? And you've even heard people say that they would like to be a man or a woman after God's own heart. But how many of us actually use that term or refer to that term properly? Well, remember when God makes this statement, he makes a statement to Samuel in regards to Saul, whom after the people have decided that they no longer want to be led by God, they don't want to have a prophet as their mouthpiece before them. They say that they want a king like other nations. Well, God's response to Samuel is that they have not rejected you, Samuel, but they have rejected me. But none of this, because he's God, has taken him by surprise. All of this, and we're going to find out that all of this has actually been part of his plan. God will work things, no matter what they are, good or bad, all these things are going to work out to be for his glory. God will get glory either through you or in spite of you. And in this case, we see it happening in both ways. And so let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 13 first. He says, Samuel said to Saul, you have acted foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which he commanded you. For now the Lord would have established your kingdom forever over Israel forever. Well, before we go any further, is that a true statement? Would God have established his kingdom forever had he obeyed? Well, sure. Did God believe that Saul actually would have obeyed? No, he did not. He's This is what we call middle knowledge. This is where God knows what you did do, but also middle knowledge is to know what you would have done. And so in this case, he says, had you had done this, this is what God would have done. However, God, God never thought that Saul would be this way. We'll show this in just a second, but look what he says in verse 14. He says, but now your kingdom shall not endure. The Lord has sought out for himself a man after his own heart, and the Lord has appointed him as, as ruler over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. So now, there's the phrase. So what does that mean? Where he says that he has selected a man after his own heart. Well, a couple of things about David. Obviously, David has shown some good qualities but he's also shown some bad qualities. The good quality is David is a faithful person. David loves the Lord. David turns to the Lord. David trusts in the Lord. As a matter of fact, even in Acts 13, 22, it's also mentioned about how David would do what the Lord tells him. Verse 22 of chapter 13 in Acts, he says, after he had removed him, he raised up David to be their king, concerning whom he also testified and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart, who... I will do all my will. I'm sorry, who will do all my will? So David will do what God tells him to do. But the question is, does David always do what God tells him to do without being told to? Will there be some times where David will make mistakes? Will David will sin? Well, obviously we know the story. David does sin. As a matter of fact, David sins so egregiously and so vividly that God brings about a punishment. He brings about a punishment, not just upon David, but upon David's house, as well as Israel. You all know the story where David has had this affair, adultery with Bathsheba. She becomes pregnant. Uh, she He kills Bathsheba's husband, Uriah. And so what is the punishment? God, one, takes the child away, but then also says that the sword shall not depart from his household. And we don't have very much long for David's household to reign under the umbrella of God's protection. But all of this has to do with part of the plan that God says. As a matter of fact, there's even another covenant that comes about from this. There's called the Davidic covenant where God has promised that a descendant of his will reign on his throne, one physically, which is going to be Solomon, but then another one who's going to reign on his throne forever. That is Jesus. Jesus is not an afterthought in all of this. Remember, go back to Genesis 49, kind of a, a throwaway statement for some people, but if we look at it and think about what God is saying, especially looking at, at, at the story of David, the life of the story of David, we'll see that this was always in the plan. In chapter 49, verse 10 in Genesis, he says, as Jacob is pronouncing blessings on his people, on his children, when he gets to Judah, he says, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet. So what's his point? Well, there is no scepter because there's no king, there's no rule. However, Remember, God makes a statement to, to Abraham that he shall have these people. They shall be a prominent nation, a great nation, uh, given in this land. Well, a couple of things come with that. One, the people, obviously the nation of Israel, the land, and then this government that's going to come as a result of all of this. And who is going to lead this government? Well, you're going to have, obviously, David, 
and then Solomon, but then God says that there's going to be someone, a descendant after his, and that is Jesus. And so even when the people ask for a king like other nations, that was not something that God could not deal with. As a matter of fact, God intends to use that to bring about this other king that they're not thinking of. And so when God makes a statement that he has chosen a man after his own heart, the term after his own heart does not mean someone who has the same, uh, that it does not. And so when God makes a statement, it does not mean that he's chosen someone who has the same heart of God, who thinks and acts and moves like God. Well, that can't be the case. One, when we look at the life of David, there's good, but there's also his life is marked by bad, the sin. That clearly is not after God's own heart. What this is, is this is someone of God's own choosing. This is really an idiomatic statement, him saying, I'm choosing someone of my own, for my own heart. I'm going to choose someone. And it's important, though, remember, God has determined this to be the case, not because that David was a person who was God-like. No, that God chose someone who God would move in him. Remember, let's go back to this. This is important. Remember, the, recalling the story of Ruth, Ruth is a Moabite. She had married a Jewish man who died. She stays with her uh, mother-in-law, Naomi, and then she ends up ultimately marrying Boaz. Remember, though, because you would think, how come Ruth never had any children? It wasn't that she was too old or anything like that, but God had not opened her womb. But then we get to Ruth chapter 4, verse 13. When Boaz marries her, it says that uh, she became his wife. And he went into her and the Lord, this word enabled her, the Lord made it so that she could conceive and she gave birth to a son. Then the women said to Naomi, blessed is the Lord who has not left you without a redeemer today and may his name become famous in Israel. May he also be to you a restorer of life and a sustainer of your old age for your daughter-in-law who loves you and is better to you than seven sons has given birth to him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap and became his nurse. Here it is. The neighbor women gave him a name saying, a son has been born to Naomi, and they named him Obed. Who was Obed? Obed is the father of Jesse. Jesse is the father of David. This is keeping in uh, with what God wants to do. God has stated that the scepter shall not depart Judah. What lineage, what tribe are they from? What tribe is Boaz from? He is from the tribe of Judah. And so Jesus comes through this. And so God has determined that through this tribe, that's the tribe that he has chosen. And because of that, the lineage of his rulership is going to come through there. Through who? Not Obviously not through Saul. Saul is not from the tribe of Judah. Saul is from the tribe of Benjamin. So that was never going to be the case. So here we have this statement that David is a man after God's own heart. It simply means that David is a man after God's own choosing. Why is that important? Well, it demonstrates the sovereignty of God. God is not beholden to choosing the ones that you might think are the ones that are most apparent, the biggest, the greatest. Remember, even choosing Israel itself, he chooses the least of all nations. Even in choosing some of the people that, he, that he's chosen, think about him choosing David. David is the least amongst his brothers, the smallest, the run of the litter, so to speak. And so God will choose David rather than choosing any of his other brothers, just like God has done the same thing with other people. Think about Gideon. Think about Abraham, as a matter of fact. God does not choose those that you think he will. God will take, in many cases, the less and do something wonderful through them. And so the whole point of him choosing David isn't because David was wonderful. The whole point of him choosing David was because God is wonderful and he's going to show his mighty works through a flawed man which is just what he does with all of us. Through flawed men and women, God will work his wonders through us. He will do things through us. We are the means by which people will hear the gospel, whereby people will be comforted, whereby people will be taken care of. He is going to use us. He's not dropping helps out of heaven. He's sending help through us, through mankind. And so the testament to that is, is verified by God using somebody like David and others throughout scripture. So God has chosen this person, David. And so that's the beauty and the importance of the story. Not that David was great. David was a wonderful person. No problem with that. But more importantly, it was God and his sovereignty. Amen.